Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I have somebody who has, he's been in the UK magic community for a long time. He's always at a high level. He's done so much awesome stuff. Everybody knows who this guy is. He is incredible. I, you built a huge brand for yourself and you really have. I'm call, talking, of course, about Damon O'Brien. How you doing, mate? I'm very well, man. Thank you. That was, that was quite an intro there. <laughs> like, that, was, that was huge. Thank you so much. It's true. You know, you've done so much. I mean, sometimes uh, you forget how much that you've done. But I mean, if you think about mm. some of the things that you, and we'll talk about this in the interview, sure. you know, there's magicians watching this that would only dream of being able to do half of what you've accomplished in your career already. So, you know, congratulations on everything that you've Thank done. You. And I know, I know you work damn hard for it as well. I mean, you, 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 yeah, yeah. You work hard. It's like nothing, nothing, nothing comes easy. And um, that's it. It's, it's the hard work you, I always tell people, you know, it will pay off. There'll be a lot of, you know, downs along the way, but you, you have to learn from them mistakes you make. And, you know, I, I'm human. I make mistakes all the time when it comes to, you know, with my career and things I've done. And I, I try and learn from each one to them to progress it and do better each time after that. Well, I want to talk to you all about your career because you've done so much. And as you say, there's been some highs, there's been some lows. I want to talk about everything. But let's start at the very beginning, Damon. What was your origin story? What kind of got you into magic? Is it the typical, my uncle bulled a coin from behind my ear moment, or is there something different to it? No, I mean, um, so when I was growing up, um, like uh, the council estate I lived on, um, like the family opposite, and um, the guy was learned, like he was doing magic to, kids out on the street and this is the stuff like when David Blaine just sort of came out and so it's like this street magic stuff and I was just more in love with how all the other kids were reacting and was running and screaming and I was just like I just fell in love with that like and I just wanted to be able to create moments like that make people happy make them smile and laugh and stuff and that was it like I, I usually bugged him and I was like you know please please teach me one trick one trick one trick one trick and my first trick I learned was card on the ceiling which is a pretty crazy trick when you think for like someone when they first learned their first card trick like a lot of people don't say that it's like how old were you learned that how old were you 13 13 and I spent months honestly months learning that trick and coming up with different variations and routines around it and I was just hooked and you know what it's like once you learn one you, you need to learn another because you know you don't want to be like a one trick pony you want to be able to do more and again I was just feeding off that buzz doing this trick to kids outside and stuff like that and yeah then I, I, I discovered Davin Ports and I, I was there that was it I was like mum can we go Davin Ports can you, can you take me to the magic shop and bit by bit it was just like buying tricks uh, buying books uh you know I was reading like card college and going through all the Daryl's encyclopedia of card magic Michael and Mar, all these and this was on videos by the way as well like these were DVDs back then so um it was so great I just remember constantly rewinding press and play and just watching it and yeah I just fell in love with magic from there that's amazing and did you gravitate to one particular type of magic I mean obviously we know you as a close-up magician mm. it, it, and that's like where your skill set is. Mm. Was there a particular, did you ever want to be on stage? Was that a goal of yours or was it always close up? And what particular, um, was there a particular type of close up you wanted to kind of do when you first got into magic? Um, I, I loved all the close up. Like I wanted to do close up and, you know, I, I liked the stage sort of stuff, but I think I liked the rawness of close up magic, of how, you know, that someone is standing two feet in front of you. Because there is always that thing where you, you get people, they sit there, they watch like a stage show, and it's like, I bet if I was on that stage, I'd figure out that people, you know, they like that, right? And um, for me, I just loved it being so intimate. And I loved doing card tricks. Like, that was my first thing, what really sort of sucked me in straight away was all the card tricks. And I, I wanted to learn them all. And, you know, uh, bit by bit, I started learning, picking up uh, sort of coin routines. I remember first time of like starting to learn coins I think I was walking around with a coin in classic palm for like two months because you sit on the train holding it in there and even in school like I was trying to hold it in classic palm and I've got like 
really small hands as well. And I was like, eh, like because he dropping the coins and uh, like hear him in the classroom just dropping on the floor, like and teaching by the way. I was like, what are you doing? So, um, but yeah, I just for me, I have always loved close up magic, and you know, I, I've dabbled a little bit in stage. I'm not gonna say I'm a stage magician at all, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely the close up. It's just I don't know, it's just sang about it. I just really enjoy it. Okay, so 13 year old Damon. He's doing card on ceiling. He's obsessed with magic. He's <laughs> know, it's, mad. it's mental, that is. It's mental. Um, you, 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 you're buying stuff. You're learning stuff. You're, what was your goal back then? Like You were starting to get really obsessed with magic. Could you see this as a career for yourself? Or was it just something that you were doing as a hobby because you found it interesting? It was just sank as a hobby back then. Like I was, so I was playing a lot of football when I was younger. And I was really into... Um, uh, I wanted to sort of get into sort of football management and I was doing stuff down at Millwall Football Club like um, did all like my sort of work experience and then I stayed on helping down there for a really long time and I honestly never sort of saw magic as career I was just a very you know I was a big hobbyist shall we say and I just loved performing and it just sort of took over my life bit by bit I guess when it comes to performing it was you know you, you start at a party and people are like going oh we give you some free drinks. Do you want to perform? And, you know, when you're young, you're like, free drink? Yeah. And um, then, you know, it's next to it. It's like, oh, if we give you 50 pounds. And so, so and it just, it just took over my life. And um, I've always sort of said when it comes to my careers and with work, I'm only ever going to do which something I'm passionate about. Like, I'm not just, you know, going to do something for the sake of it, you know, for, because it's a job. You know, I used to work in an investment bank. I left that because I didn't feel passionate about it. So it's magic I'm just passionate about. I love it. So when you when you left school, um, you, mm. you mentioned working in a bank. Did, obviously, at what point did you say, okay, I'm going to make a career of this for myself. I'm going to I'm going to go out and try and make money from this. I'm going to, this is going to be my job. Was it immediately after school, or was it working in a no. bank and not enjoying it that made you can't? Where, where, what made you decide to kind of take that leap? Yeah. It, it was working in like a few different sort of jobs, you know, like, and then going to the bank. And I just, uh, as good as they were, like for, you know, as a career, I just didn't feel um, inspired or enthusiastic, enthusiastic enough about it. And I always just enjoyed it when I was performing. I was like, you know what? I want to perform. I want to do magic for a living. And, you know, I knew I kind of maybe had the sort of safety sort of guards of like, well, you know, if, goes bad I guess I could go back to maybe this old job and stuff like that um you know luckily my oh, sorry about that sirens um my um my mum she was super supportive of it and you know she got behind me completely on it and I was just like I just had to do it for myself I was just like you know I'm gonna do it and then it was actually the same sort of year I chose to do that was when David Blaine done the whole stunt in the box when you know, and I just looked at it, it's like 50,000 or 50,000 plus people or something. I think it was that night around Tower Bridge. They're all on there down and they're watching a man just coming out of a box. And I was just like, you know what? I, I want to perform. I want to entertain people. And that was it. That's great. Well, you know, we think about you now as like super successful and, you know, you're absolutely awesome. Was that the case when you decided to go pro? So when you decided to go pro, were you, were you struggling to get gigs or did 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 you very easily find the gig? Because we know you as a hustler. I mean, you hustled, man. You were, you, you mentioned at the beginning, you worked yeah. hard and that's why you achieved the level of success that you have. Mm. Did, did that come immediately or was it something you had to work on? No, I had to work my ass off. Like I started off, um, like for say, like we're going to say from paid sort of stuff, I started off in uh, just local pubs around my area and, um, you know, I was performing two, three hours for like 50 pound. Most I was getting sometimes was a hundred pound. And every bit of money I was earning from that was literally being invested into more props or to business cards, to setting up a website, everything literally went back in. I was making no money, I would say for the first two, two and a half years, maybe. Like seriously, like everything I had went and I was, I remember literally getting the yellow pages up call in every pub I could think of like and which I could knew I could get to so I didn't drive at that point I was thinking right I've got to jump on the train or get a bus there like can I get there in that sort of time and 
you know, I got knocked back so many times, but I was in pubs. Like I remember literally walking up to a group of table once going, Hey guys, you mind if I show you a bit of magic? And one guy literally told me, he was like, if you don't piss off, I'll show you a trick when I put this knife in your throat. And like, that's the sort of, yeah, seriously, this is the kind of like, uh, sort of places I was performing in. And, you know, it's scary to think, I, you know, had to do it. I just wanted to show someone a trick. Um, and, you know, bit by bit, I was performing more regular, getting a bit more confidence and taking feedback from people on what they thought, what they, you know, what they believe would do better in the performances. Um, and because people kept saying, like, when you relax, you're so much more better when you're, like, I, I noticed, you know, at the beginning, we always try to stick to the script to get these scripts with some tricks. And I was trying to go word for word, which is the worst mistake I ever did. And um, yeah, and then it was just happened one night. I heard about this party up in Tiger Tiger in uh, less sort of near Leicester Square Piccadilly area. And I just blagged my way into there. I just lied to the doorman, said I was the hired magician for the night before I tried my chances. And he let me in. And I was just performing magic to a bunch of like reality TV stars and everything. And people who have just come off X Factor and um, or they've been in Big Brother, stuff like that. And I met this guy who uh, was like a talent agent and he was like, oh, we have a party next week. Um, would you be willing to come to it? And I was like, yeah, sure, of course. Cool. So like, you know, looking at it as an opportunity to hand out business cards and that. And it ended up being one of the Brit Awards after parties. Like, I was like, oh shit. Yeah, so, um, and that sort of night, you know, I remember just handing out business cards to everyone I could, grabbing photos with any eyes so I could use it on the website um for promotion and again like you know I wasn't paid for that night I just literally turned up there off my own back because I knew like I, I truly believed that this time and these investments will pay off eventually and and that's one thing that I've noticed about you from a marketing point of view you're brilliant when it comes to social proof like there's photos of you performing to celebrities mm. and all over the place I mean is that that's always been a really important part of your brand. Would you, would you agree with that kind of the guy that um, goes there and? Yeah, yes and no. So there's a weird thing with it. Like, you know, I don't try and bother them too much like for photos and stuff when I'm at these events. But because I do get invited, I'll, I'll do it because at the same time, it's strange. People will look at it as like, okay, right. So say for instance, you had a photo with performing magic to like Prince Charles or something like that. People having this weird head of like, oh, if it's good enough for them, then it's got to be good enough for me. It's it's a strange thing how people do it. So it does help. Um, and so because over the years, I have got these things. I think sometimes as with social media, people kind of expect you to have that if they know you're at the same event as people. But um, yeah, it's definitely, I can't like it, it's helped massively, those sort of things. But it's amazing how many of them you actually end up becoming friends with and stuff like because you see him on those sort of circuits I've seen this quite a bit and you can't not get talking to them because they say you would have gotten and most of them are just super chilled and down to earth these artists that's fantastic now here's a question for you what advice can you give somebody when it comes to creating a brand and what I mean by that is you are so unique in that you you're you, it, you're yourself and that's one of the things I respect about you so much mm. Like you see so many magicians going out there and it's almost like you've taken a close up magician clothing machine and you've just pressed the button a hundred yeah. times and they turn up in the same suits. They do the same Omni deck. They've got the same lines and, and you are very different. Exactly. <laughs> I, I've and, turned up like this. Yeah, you do. And that's, see, and that's not the advice you hear on forums. You know, you get a new magician going on a Facebook forum. I want to be a professional magician. What do you do? Buy yourself a suit, young man. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> and make sure that you're dressed better than the, but <clears throat> I massively respect that. I really do. Yeah. Any advice on, on being yourself? Cause people are going to be watching this going, that's not going to work. I can't, I can't be myself. I can't turn up at a corporate no. event and, and, and be myself, but you've proven that you can be successful by being yourself and you can grow a great brand yeah. that's recognizable doing it your own way. So cool. Well, for me it was basically like I said with those, these first sort of few gigs you know I did exactly like what you said like, I, I was in a suit I was you know going there performing hands I, like, I never felt comfortable I just felt like I was like this like constantly like pulling up the sleeves or just feeling 
restricted, shall we say, like I couldn't feel like I could relax. And bit by bit, I started like kind of losing the layers. So it was like the suit jacket come off and the shirt sleeves were rolled up the whole entire time performing. And then people like started seeing some of the tattoos and things that like happened in the arms. I was like, oh, it's a bit different. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I started sort of trying, I was just like, you know what, let me just turn up one night just how I feel comfortable like when I'm going out doing magic to friends at like a party and being more casual and I would just turn up in a pair of jeans t-shirt and just went and I felt like I was performing so much better like because I was being more myself and I remember watching a Jeff McBride DVD and he said when you turn up to a party you want to make sure that everyone's eyes are on you straight away that they know who you are, that you stand out above all of them. Now, I've always like, I don't know, that seems to just sit in my head for so long. And it was true because it was like, I'm not like your average looking magician or like, you know, when you, you see him turn up because people, they do have this weird sort of assumption in their head that a magician should be all suited and booted for some reason. And, you know, I, I turned up to, gigs and people think I'm a bloody DJ a lot of the time and they're like oh you, you DJ right and I'm like no I'm here to do magic and it sort of throws people and I'm like oh okay like and it sort of shocks them and so it's just worked for me because I will use it sort of to my advantage and everything like that of you know do a hot shot into the baseball cap or you know just playing around with little things and like it's just it's just worked for me and I always say the bit like the more comfortable you feel is your style the better you will perform, honestly. Um, you know, don't be someone you're not. Um, you know, I, I've, you know, I've been stupid in the past where like I felt like I was, you know, being shit copies of other type or trying like, you know, like every magician like tried to do the David Blaine type thing where people would just sit there and stare and that's all. Let your personality shine. Like I, you know, I, I try and have fun with people. I take the piss out of them when I'm doing a gig. Like I let them take the piss out of me as well. Like I, I find it funny. Um so just you know have fun be yourself and you'll notice it'll, you'll perform so much better and i think you are starting to see that more now like the younger generation up there being more like casual smart because I, I never got it when i used to see magicians who performed in nightclubs no wearing a full suit i'm like point someone out in this nightclub who's wearing a full suit for a night out in to have fun they're wearing jeans a jumper maybe like a shirt and a jumper like underneath and you know, you wouldn't say like, you know, it's not the suit that makes the man. Like I know there's that saying where it goes, oh, the suit makes man. It, it's not, you know, it's not all. Completely agree with you. Totally agree, 100%. Let me ask you about performance because mm. you have this ability when you perform for people, you'll do the same routines and effects as other people. Yeah. And people will lose their shit. Like they will go, you know, we talk about the David Blaine style reactions, you know, when David <laughs> Blaine first burst on the scene and everyone was like running off and screaming. I've seen so many videos of you doing that. And I've seen, I, I, you know, I've spoken to some, you know, we've got a lot of mutual friends who've said to me, oh yeah, that, that, that's the reactions he gets all the time. And I'm like, he's doing the same stuff as everyone else. You know, I've heard yeah. people in the UK go, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They only react like that because they're American. No, I've seen you over and over and over and over again make people literally lose their mind seeing reactions that most magicians would dream of getting again and again and again, doing the same stuff or but, uh, slight variations, but you know, but variations on the yeah. team. But yeah. You're doing close up magic like everyone else, but the yeah. reaction level is through the roof. How do you do it? What's your secret? Um, it, it doesn't happen all the time. I can honestly tell you that. Like, I've gone to gigs where. Honestly, I think I could have cut my head off, put it down, carried on doing the card trick, and they would have gone, great name. Like, seriously, I've had ones like that that have been that bad. But it is nice when it's, you know, you get those reactions. I think, you know, I honestly can't give you an honest answer of what that is. I, I'm very relaxed when I perform. I said I'm very chilled. I just show them I'm human. I don't, I ain't one of these magicians who suddenly think I've got super natural gifts and abilities and stuff like that. People ask me a question, I, I will tell them, very honestly about like magic and you know how I learn and stuff like that and what I've done and I always smile while I've chat there's very a lot of people you see performers they're very uh, shy maybe a bit they they the good perform but like they can't talk about everything else like you know when I used to perform up 
um, some of the football matches and stuff like that. I, I'm a football fan, so I, I can happily chat away about football and stuff like that. But even if I wasn't, I, I'm, I'm happy to have a full conversation where I don't know. It's like I, I just try and engage as much as I can with people where I make them feel relaxed, where it's, they, it's okay to laugh and have fun and stuff like that. And Sank I always do to get people really hooked straight in when I'm performing. Uh, the very first trick I, I will do, I'll always borrow something personal from them. The very first thing. So whether that's a ring, their phone or something, because they're instantly then invested in the trick. They can't turn it. Like if someone walks over like at the beginning of a drinks reception and you're holding their like wedding ring or engagement ring, something like that, they're not going to take their eyes off you. Like if someone comes over and starts speaking, they'll go like, oh, well, hold up. He's got, he's got my ring here. And that engage, gets that next person like, wait, what? So then, you know, you do whatever trick where it's like ring flight or something like that. And they're instantly blown away because it's like they know at this point it's, that ain't no clever gimmick or something like that. That was my ring. That's a real, you know, item. Like, I know it doesn't just magically vanish or something like that. So I think those little things will help straight away when you perform. I tell people that, like, you know, go in, be, you know, make it about them. They're, they're the stars of the show, not you. Like, and it should be about them. And that's, I think that's the thing as well, where I've missed performing to live like audience because it's very hard to just go, oh, can I borrow your phone? Can I borrow your ring straight away? So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's those things. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's really good advice. What's your thousand timer, as Greg Wilson would say? You know, that trick that if you were caught with, you know, somebody who could give you the biggest break you've had of your career, and you got one trick to impress the hell out of them. What would that be? Ooh, that's a great one. Um, oh, damn. I know it sounds crazy, but like I always get really good reactions from it, which is uh, pyro perception. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it gets really good reactions every time I've done it because it's just how, I don't know, because they can feel it and they can see it's not something stuck on and, Everyone just goes a bit bananas for that. So I, I, I always feel like it's such a good trick. And because you can repeat it again and if we have a different card and everything like that, you're like, oh, wait a minute, hang on. <laughs> it's not just the same card. Because I love that when you get someone at, later on that night and they have to see you do it again and it's a different card. They're like, no, that was like six of hearts or something earlier. I'm like, no, that's, that's completely different. Like, how have you done that? So yeah, probably that. Like, I know it sounds like weird because like, I know people are like, oh, well, I would have done this trick or this one just works for me i think but the other thing is that kind of fits your style as well you know yeah i suppose it's really important to think of tricks that do fit your image and you've you've created this yeah. whole brand for yourself there's certain tricks that you you i can imagine you doing perfectly but there's, there's other stuff like that i wouldn't imagine. Oh, i'll do horrible <laughs> and, and, yeah there's a there's a subject horrible. that's something that you do so well and i see so many magicians performing and they're doing a trick and I'm like, they're doing it well, but it doesn't really fit them. I can't see that person doing that trick, but your trick selection always seems to be kind of really on point. It's like, you know your character, you know your brand, you know the sort of magic that you want to do and, yeah. and, and, and you do it. Is, is, that, is that the case? Do you consciously think, do you walk around Blackpool in the dealer hall going, well, that's a good trick, but Damien O'Brien wouldn't do that. that, yeah. that that's not, you know. Yeah, not... I've, I always look at things as like, would, would I, could I do that in the situations of walk around? Because that's my, obviously, the majority of my gigs are walking around, like table hopping and stuff like that, or just, you know, in a drinks reception, you know, mixing and mingling. So I have to try and look at each one as like, could I, you know, make that work for me? And, you know, there's some tricks, I think that they're, they're phenomenal, but like sometimes they could be a bit too story-based, like there's a long story-based routine. And for me, like, I love it. And I probably sometimes still will end up buying everything. Yeah, cool. Like, you know, but it's, I'm probably not going to use that at a gig or something because I feel like some, there's a lot of people who just, they want a sort of quick impact. They want to move and stuff like that. I want to maybe get from A to B. And so I won't really do that. I'll kind of try and do things which are a bit more quicker pace and that. So I'm always looking around, but again, like I don't want to have only tricks that I can do only on social media. Like I want to be able to do so because there will be a time that people go, oh, um, we saw this trick. Uh, we want you to do this live at our event. And that booking could potentially 
be resting on that trip and you're like crap I can't do that like that's that is for camera only so um I think you always have to be conscious of what you're going to do and um if you're going to do something yeah just just practice it but I I say to people as well that um I look at a lot of gigs as practice as well because I was I'm like Miro ain't going to tell me if it caught it <laughs> like um I need to just go out and also just get a feel with it whether it's maybe just sitting around with some friends and I try something out and see their reaction and then slowly you build like a sort of presentation around it like of how you present that trick and you know I think that's a really good way of just getting a feel for tricks as well do they work don't they work like and you know test it out here and there with also kind of different characters of people as well some people are a bit like maybe harder to impress some people who are super super like easy to impress that they react to anything but if they don't really maybe react to it, it's like hmm, maybe that's not yeah. that type one what's for me so i always think maybe that's a really good way to uh sort of try and out trial and error for tricks well here's a question based on what you said there um that's made me think a, a question i get on the channel all the time is mm. um what do you do when you've been busted you know you've, you've done a trick and somebody's called you out on it or whatever it may be uh, oh you turned over two cards there it seems because i get this question all the time it feels like especially for newer magicians it's their morbid fear. Oh my God, what happens if that trick goes wrong? And we've all been there where we've bought that shiny new trick and we've practiced and practiced and practiced it, put it in the gig bag and it never gets worked in. It ends up in the bottom drawer because every time we try and do it, we're like, no, it's not going to work. I'm just, I'm going to stick to the ambulance last time again, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what, do you have any advice on like, like, you know, you said that you go out and you practice stuff because the mirror is not going to call you on it. Taking that approach, what, how do you deal with it when somebody goes, Hey, I saw what you did there. I just go, shit, you realise I'm human. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> like, I, that's it. Like, I just go, oh, I'm human. You, you find out, shit. Like, and people were sort of like, I think, because you're not, like, insulting them, their intelligence of it, they just sort of laugh. And, uh, like, you know, I just see no reason to try and lie to them because then you suddenly see, I've seen performers suddenly get super defensive about that. And they go, well, well I, I tell you what, watch this one then. And they're like really on it. Like, and I'm like, calm down, calm down, just relax. Go, you know, if the catch go, oh man, you, you, have you seen a trick or something? Like, like I, I play it sometimes even like that. And they go, oh no, I just got, I got cool, man. Like most people won't catch it. Awesome. Let them have their moment. Like, you know, and that makes me feel better. Go like, and go, and then I'll maybe bring it in. Maybe like next one after, one after that, I will say to them, I tell you what, cause you, You've actually got quite a sharp eye. Um, so you can help them out with this one. And I make them feel like it's important that they have that sharp eye. And then I'll do like the same else where I know they physically can't catch out. Like I'll just be like, screw you, you're getting an invisible deck now. <laughs> when they just can't work anything out. So um, yeah, most of the time I, I don't mind. Like I, I, when I've dropped cards and out on the floor, I'm like, oh well, like, you know, they care. Like, and or if I do drop cards or something on the floor and people bring attention, go, oh. You dropped some cards. I was like, oh, really? Now I throw the rest on the floor. And they're like, what? And I go, pick, pick one of the cards, just like pick one. And they say, it. and then I'll do like sort of like a triumph routine out of that, all the messed up cards. And so then it ends up actually being somewhere. They actually sometimes, I've had people question me, go, you meant to do that, right? And I'm like, no, I just generally drop the cards because, you know, <laughs> and I'll go because I'm shit. But I just say something like that. And they're like, oh, <laughs> okay. But what I'm seeing here is that's such an important skill for a close-up magician to have, which is having the ability to not be too scripted. You know, no. just like you fly. You've got to be loose. Yeah, you've got to be loose based on what's happening. And, you know, you might not plan on going in this situation, but something happens and that, you know, changes things yeah. on the fly. Well, this is when we was when we were shooting Killer Magic, there was like, obviously we had to like deliver scripts and everything. So, uh, the production team all knew what we were doing and I remember like Anthony Owen he always used to go to me just you know you be a little bit more looser with your scripts you went because I like it that you can just instantly like have fun with someone and chat away and you know they, they and this thing because someone could suddenly make a joke and you can't suddenly be like thrown off by it you've got to be able to have that bit of banter back with them like if they come out and say something where I remember once like um because it was Jazz, it was very early for jazz, like coming into Magic on that sort of level as well. And um, I remember she sort of just 
didn't say anything for a second and just went straight back into the script and was like, oh, you should have just made a joke. And like, luckily it was only you know, like, um, sort of like a casting sort of thing. So, and um, you know, she was like, yeah, I should have, shouldn't I? I was like, yeah, just, you know, it's good to have that in mind and you kind of know steps, but just, just chill, just be you, perform and have fun. And when you are doing that, you're so much better performer because they're going to be, no one can ever anticipate what is going to happen in the exact situation. Like, you know, whether someone just suddenly joins the group of people and wants to say something, or, you know, someone is going to make a joke about something, or as you said, you going to go, oh, I caught that. you got to be willing and know how to adapt. And I think just be relaxed and just, you know, have fun with me. Great. And, and I think that, you know, I've talked about this on the channel before, but I think magicians, especially newer magicians getting into magic, they spend so much time yeah. thinking about the trick and the technique and, and the script that they forget that the most important thing is you've got to walk up to a bunch of people who don't know you. And within five yeah. seconds, you've got to get them to the point where not only do they stop having a conversation with themselves, but to actually focus on, engage. on you. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a difficult thing to do, you know, to just walk up to yeah. a group old and just be the guy that they want to see immediately. I mean, that's. Well, th there used to be this pub I used to perform at um, like every other Monday, like, really close to where I live actually still and um, I remember that there used to be this one guy who was always there every week and he came up to me at the end and he was like he went your tricks are really good but he was like when you perform it's not like over as engaging he went, he went but he went I've seen moments when suddenly again like you relax and you, you've had like a joke he went that is better and like he was just like I, I think just you went you've got the tricks down like don't be like you know oh, it's all about the trick you know I think it's all about the performance and I, I really sort of took that and then you know I've met like other performers whether it was from music or acting and stuff like that and you know I, I try and tell people a lot now myself that 10% is the trick 90% is the performance you know I always say like if I've gone to a wedding and performed I want them at the end of that to really remember me and then maybe if they're at a wedding you know, months down the line, they see another magician, they go, oh, you know what? They still remember my name where they can go to them. You know what? We saw a magician called Damien, really, really good, like that. You know, just that you've left a lasting impression where they've enjoyed the performance as well as the trick, because that's what it is. It's, it's a performance at the end of the day. It's a show. Perfect advice. Now, you mentioned it earlier, so let's bring it up, Killer Magic. Would you say that was the, I mean, would you say that that was your first big break like that was the moment where you were kind of like okay I've been going out doing close-up I've been doing gigs I've been getting better gigs and better gigs but now you know I've been offered a chance to be on an ensemble tv show I mean that must be yeah it was huge I mean I had done um Fool Us just before that um when it was over here oh, I and the was after I didn't realize I didn't... Ah, so Fool Us uh happened uh before, like maybe a couple of years before and the actual pilot episode of uh, Ben O and John Archer and those guys I actually auditioned and I, I completely messed up completely messed up because so inexperienced never like really done any sort of stage sort of stuff and I ballsed it big time and um, the production crew like they was really really you know relaxed and I was like look we're doing this season now of it like season one over in the UK We'd like you to come back and try again and i went back and you know did the routine and it went down well and even now i watch that back and i'm like wow it looks so awkward on stage like just the word i'm using constantly uh, um, uh, um it's horrible but killer magic definitely was the sort of bigger break because it was a series where people got a chance now to get to know you a little bit more than the five minutes you get for say uh four lots or six minutes whatever it is so, you know, you're on this show each week and you're getting to play with loads of different styles of magic. So they can see you can do more than just one kind of, you know, trick with one type of genre of magic as well. And because there were so many different personalities, I think that got to come out like me and Ben, like I, I got on so well with Ben Hart. Like we just mess around all the time. And Dee Chris, D Chris was like, he's seriously a friend for life. Like I message D like daily. Um, you know, and when, like it's weird because people, if people was to see D and see me, they'd be like, there's no way these two could be friends like that. If they just sort of look, because people will, they judge the book by the cover. D is like, 
he is honestly like family to me. He's like a brother. And we just sort of all kicked, like, you know, got on so well and just had so much fun with it. And Anthony Owen, you know, he helped so much, like um, little bits, what he would do and tricks and stuff he would say. And people don't realize, like, the first, the very first episode of Killer Magic was we had some serious people involved in that. Like Andy Nyman was like coaching us with things, what to do and all that. We had uh, Sharky and Long write the full first uh, first episode, like all the tricks going, right, you're gonna do this, this, and it was like, these are like big guys, these are like serious guys. So uh, they actually was the ones who came up with the idea for the card in the fish, like Sharky and Long. So, uh, which like, when I was first heard, I was like, I didn't know fish, you really? Like, I was like, okay, well, and then obviously you got the reaction it did, uh, which I love now still. And but Killer Magic, yeah, it was so like great to just say, oh, we've got our own show on BBC Three, and it was it suited the style of the show as well. Because BBC Three was very like you know aimed at the younger generation, you know, and it was that channel you you watch Family Guy maybe on later at night when you're chilling in bed and you can be kind of relaxed, and you know it was aimed at a lot of students and stuff like that. So I think it worked for the perfect sort of channel, and you know it was that perfect stepping stone to take us to the next bit. And what, um, how, how did it come about, if you don't mind me asking, like, was it off the back of the success of Fool Us that you got offered it? Or was it like everything else that you do, which is hustling and getting your name out there? And um, Anthony actually never told me that. It, um, he just, I just got an email from Objective. Like I'd done like a couple of auditions and shows which never sort of happened or anything. And it, sometimes Anthony was involved and sometimes it wasn't. And it's really strange because I was talking to a couple of people about a similar kind of concept. But I remember going, like, because I had gone into so many different auditions with Objective. I always had to do, like, a trick or something like that. I went into this world. I was like, I ain't going to do no tricks. Like, because it, it was the point. They're all magicians. They know exactly what I'm doing and stuff like that. I remember being super chilled in there. I remember, like, sitting down in the office. I was like, this, like, right back into the chair, like that, sort of slumped back. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think it'd be good. We was kind of coming up with this idea. I think we need like a magic hero type team type thing, like the Avengers. And I was like, yeah, well, that's what we're thinking. I was like, yeah, it'd be great. And, and within like an hour after leaving the office, Anthony called me. He was like, do you want to come back Monday then so we can record you for stuff? I was like, okay. Because they even so said to me, do you want to do a trick? I was like, oh, I didn't bring nothing. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, I was super like chilled about it. I think I was more relaxed in that one than I've ever been for any audition. And I wasn't trying to be arrogant with it. It was just like, you know what? Let me just go in there fully relaxed and just chat and hear what they want to sort of pitch and everything. And because sometimes you could go into those meetings, you know, if it's if it's saying like it's going to happen or not. But um, I don't know. I think I'm pretty sure probably it was just they had me for other auditions and they was like, yeah, let's get him in. See if he's got any ideas or something he can maybe contribute to it. OK, that's great. And I, was, I, I want to ask one question about Foolus as well. I, I thought it was afterwards, so I'm going to go back quickly to Foolus. Sorry? Obviously, we're in the first season, and, and you know, you, you actually spoke to them before the pilot episode. Sure. Um, were you a little bit worried doing that? Because that's your first... And what I mean by that is now, eight, and I was speaking to Lee Hathaway about this a little while ago, eight seasons in, we know exactly what the format of the show is. Yeah. But back when you were involved... Nobody knew what was the foolish concept was really. Nope. All we knew is that Penn and Teller had built a career for themselves out of like taking the piss out of magicians and <laughs> busting <laughs> tricks. And it's kind of like, was it a bit kind of a, a concern going, well, hang on a minute. I could be made to look like a bit of a fool on this. Program. Like an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, very worrying because you think, oh shit, if they like expose out everything I do or like are they going to broadcast it and the you know the producers and everything were kind of like you know they're very trying to keep you relaxed no no that's not going to happen if they go too far like that then we will we'll cut it like the last thing we want to do is make any magicians look stupid we don't want that we want it to be like the best magicians in the world are coming to try and perform for Penn and Teller and they're going to see if they can kind of work it out but they're going to do it in code and then when obviously they were saying like Johnny Thompson is involved and stuff like that, it kind of made you feel a bit more relaxed. Obviously, Johnny Thompson is just, you know, he's a legend. And so, you know, and just even being around him alone was incredible. But yeah, it was um, 
nerving again because so at that point I was still so inexperienced but I was just like you know what it's a chance to gain experience at the same time and that's where you got to sort of look at it and you know I, I practice 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 but obviously I said the first time to pilot so my own personal thought that it didn't work the way it did but I learned from it like I said before and I went back and um have fun the next one time. thing that I'm getting from this interview and one thing that uh you've done over and over again in your career is you just put yourself out there like you just yeah, you go. constantly put yourself out there don't you you i think you have to sometimes you just got to jump into the deep end it's like i think i say sometimes you have to run before you can crawl and i just don't want to ever look back and think man why didn't i take that opportunity when i had it because sometimes these opportunities they they come once yeah. and you've got to take it with both hands and you know, try and just milk it for everything it's worth. And, you know, fingers crossed, everything great comes from it. But, uh, um, you know, at the same time, you do have to be cautious. I think you've got to weigh up the options too. Yeah. But most times, you know what? If you're doing nothing else, why not? Absolutely. Now, you do Foolish, you do Killer Magic. So now you're, you're riding a career high. I mean, that's two primetime TV shows. Um, you know, people know who you are. Obviously, that's going to lead to better gigs and bigger gigs and more gigs and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you also really started to do a lot on social media, weren't you? I mean, you were like, yeah, you were you everywhere on social media. Like there were viral yeah. going up of you. Yeah, what? I kind of got this thing because of because of Killer Magic doing the the card in fish trick. I suddenly got a load of food, drink type brands coming to me going hey look we want you to do a trick with this and um i think the pizza express one was the first one went viral like it hit like a million views in a day which like at that point it was like oh, crap like what the hell like and they they was doing stuff with um the guy from manfa street uh adam richmond um him and obviously at that point he was really big because of the shows he was doing for food now so that like sort of worked really well for that kind of brand and it was just sort of fun like i was doing them and then more brands started seeing different bits. I was like, oh, actually, that's kind of cool because it's a tailor-made trick. I was doing a trick with a pizza and stuff like that. And social media, like, especially Instagram, was on the up sort of thing. Like, it was really becoming the big thing to have, like, to promote yourself. And I just, you know, we was pitching out to brands. I had, like, you know, management as well helping out. Like, they knew people. And it's like, you know, I think this guy would be good. Um, and we had, like, Coca-Cola come to us and was like, look, we want to, they was building an app. And I was like, we want to basically put a load of cool content videos together. And I was like, we want you to do tricks with the brand, but also stuff that's not included in the brand, where it's just maybe it's there in the background. So it's not going Coca-Cola down your throat, sort of stuff like that. And so those are ones I, I liked. So I was like, okay, cool. I can just do normal routines, which I enjoy performing. And yeah, it's just bit by bit, like different ones came in. And then I'm, I'm quite good at knowing how to approach brands as well. Like, um, years even before i had tv stuff and that i had got uh like sort of uh product placement deals from nike from new era caps like new era caps you know 13 years later i'm still sponsored by them which is incredible to have a relationship that long with a brand you know um so it was just once you learn sort of the ways of talking to these companies and finding out other people maybe who work with them going hey would you be kind enough to introduce me <laughs> like uh I got this idea, like, and they're like, yeah, cool, like, no worries. And uh, that's the thing, like, um, there's plenty of tricks out at a minute with, with branded products, which I've got where I'm like, I'm holding off on it because I want to use it for a certain way. So, and I'm always just trying to think, how can I work in a routine with a brand as well? So I just think it's very important. And you continue to do a lot with various different social media companies and influencers mm. now to this day, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I do a lot. So, yeah, it's crazy. So here's a question, and I really am interested in knowing the answer to this. So Go you, you've spent a long time building up your career. Like you are flying high. Let's know no bones about it. You've got companies, you get, you've got influence coming to you saying, I want to work with you. You've been on TV. Yeah. You've been on primetime TV. Yeah. Why did you decide to go on BGT? Because so, B that is because like... I mean, it's not as much of a risk now, is it? Because Russ Stevens no, is no. involved in it. Back in the day, it was career suicide. But now Russ looks sure. after everybody. And But even still, like, 
you're at a perceived very high level by your, you know, an influencer comes to you. They want to work with yeah. Dan O'Brien because you're the guy to go to. You, they know that you're going to be a great person to work with. You're going to come up with some great content in a very unique way. You're going to make them look good. But then BJT are kind of all about, well, here's this guy that's looking for his big break. Aren't you worried that there's sure. like some influence there going, hang on a minute. <laughs> I've seen him before. <laughs> Do you know what no, I mean? So I, I completely get that. And, you know, for years, like when it's actually strange, because when we was uh, doing Killer Magic, they were still approaching all of us. And I was like, no, no, no. Because I still feel, feel like, you know, as we said, at that point, I still those, had magicians where they was taking the piss out of them still sometimes on the show. Because that's how it started. Like, Everyone knew it was like, no, I ain't going near that show. Like, you take the piss out of magicians. Like, that's how BGC very much started until Russ got involved and sort of really showed them, no, magic can be bloody great on this show if you give it the uh, respect it deserves. And so a few years after, so Killer Magic came out in 2015, and it's like three years later now. Like, I had done a few things, and I was thinking, what's out there? And I saw with side noticing kind of like magic on TV was sort of, coming down it suddenly went really mental it's like it was everywhere so it started coming down I was like should I do it and like I thought let's just go into the because I got headhunted for it and I was like let's just go in to see what they've got to say so I went and had the meeting with BGT I was like right let's just see it can't hurt and I was like okay sounds cool why not and they was like it was very like look if it goes horrible like promise we'll not show it like it will not go out there we want to protect you and Russ you know he was like you know I'll, I'll do everything to try Make sure it doesn't go out there as well if it goes, you know, tits up. Because I kept going to, look, I'm not a stage magician, close-up magician. And I was like, don't worry, like, I'm working routine. But at the same time, I wasn't very, I wasn't doing well mentally. I was in a really, really shitty state. And, you know, I pulled out, like, weeks before the audition. So I was suffering so bad with depression and, like, anxiety and mental health. And went and got some help. And they approached me again in, like, sort of summer 2019 talked to me about coming up with it and it's like a bit better place and I was like okay let me think started coming up with routines and uh leading up to the audition uh Russ calls me up he's like look I think this routine would suit you freaking perfectly like you know think and he went like what do you think I was like yeah it sounds great and so we started chatting more and more about it and I was like well if we incorporate this into it like and put a phone trick and uh, I literally jumped on train up to Blackpool to go rehearse with Russ. And for me, it was just like, I felt because I had been out a bit for a little bit of time now, like away from maybe the TV sort of spotlight. And I was thinking, right, what can I do now to suddenly give it another boost again? And I know if you do well, it's such, it's such a huge reach, what you can get from the show. It is, you know, you know can imagine we have people watching, but like this show, which is watched by like eight, nine million people at times, you know, that's, insane numbers like I uh, you know it's it's insane I try and tell people this all the times like it is actually quite scary the reach that show has like of uh, you and audience and you know Russ gets like he I think it was Russ he, he really reassures you and then I think seeing the success that Ben had on it um guys like Darcy Oak uh, John Archer and stuff like that people I've watched for such a long time and I was like you know why not they seem to have done all right. Could it be bad of me? I don't think so. And I was like, I'm going in confident with a routine I think is very strong. First routine, uh, floored them. So I was like, you know, it's what you want. So it helps. I felt like it could be bad. And and the audition was the metal phone routine, wasn't it? Was that? Yeah, that's right. Which yeah, so that was metal so phone well routine. Together. It was so well yeah. put together with, with, with all the different elements. And oh, it was amazing. Well, this is it. This was uh, where, like, you know, Russ is influenced because uh, Russ came out with this crazy script and he was just like, he went, and I was like, yeah, I was like, I don't know if that really feels like me. He went, trust me. He went, it's going to work for you so well. He went, like, you went, you're a very chilled, nice guy. When you're just talking around, he went, like, you're quite uh, sort of softly spoken. He went, it's, it's just going to work for you. He went, I, I really believe that. And I was like, okay. And um, obviously no one had done this metal phone thing because it hadn't even come out. It was funny, it came out the same week at Blackpool, like a few days after I filmed it. So I was like, brilliant. Um, and I was like, bragging I was like, yeah, that trick is brilliant, get it. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it was just, you know, such a career highlight that moment. Like, um, you know, I, I thought I would get four yeses and go, I, 
it was great. Never in a million, I could honestly tell you, I never in a million years thought I would get 2,000 people on all four of them standing up clapping the way they did. Like, and obviously TV's edited, but it was up for a very long time. And I was like, yeah, seriously, like, I don't know how I didn't break down in tears out there as well, because in my head, all I could think about was 2018, of like when I literally was having a breakdown. So it was kind of like come full circle that, you know what, I went back and I, uh, you know, done what I was meant to do. That's great. That's an amazing moment. And obviously, you then carried on doing very, very well in, in, in the, you know, mm. through the whole, through the whole thing. Was it awkward? Obviously, because when you did the set, uh, when you did the semis in the final, mm. you, you, it was during COVID, it was during lockdown. So yeah. it must have been a very different experience to yeah. when you were doing the auditions you know you've got thousands of people watching you then all of a sudden you walk in and it's just video screens and four judges and a few crew yeah. it is it was very very strange i think it was harder for people <coughs> excuse me it's all right <laughs> well choke um no i think it was harder for say people who are like comedians and stuff like that. i think that was a lot harder for them or people who really, really rely on audience reaction for stuff. Because I was doing close up and it was like, we knew each time it was always gonna be about the four judges, which were involved, like again, um, it was a little bit easier. And I think it's also like when you've got like, so the first audition, knowing 2000 people were there watching you, it's, it could be quite intimidating. Um, where this is like, uh, these are just a bunch of computer screens. And that's how I just try to try and look at it as like, this is just a light wall that it's not screens of people at home. And I think that helped massively. So um, it was, you know, a bit weird because obviously people don't see this like, because well, it's like pre-recorded the semi-final and final. Uh, the claps that happened at the right time because they put in like a recorded clap. So you've done the trick and like, there's like this delay and suddenly this claps come in and you're like, it's all froze you. I remember one beer at the semi-final time went, Oh, carry on. <laughs> I went back into it but um, it does throw you a little bit but it was what it is and you just had to make the most out of the situation and and the advantage is you had Ashley Banjo there who became your biggest advocate I mean mm. he was yeah you know he, I think he became like a member of the Damien uh, O'Brien fan club at that point like well was... I, I've known Ashley for such a long time like um, I met Ashley before he went on BGT so very very long time we met at some uh event in london and they was dancing i just was chatting to him and it was strange because i actually straight away that same night like you know people could be very funny about clients for food i go oh yeah like, i can do go this way like he just started talking to me he said something about a baseball cap i was like, oh yeah no i do stuff in new areas oh, he went i'd love to do that i was like well, here you go here's the person's email <laughs> i didn't care i was like here you go i went just tell her i sent you because i've got a really really good relationship with them I went, I'm sure they'll look after you. And they did. They was like, oh yeah, no worries. Like, and this thing I've like it's it's more than a sort of a corporate partnership. It's like I said, we've got full-on friendships me in your era. And so, and he always remembered that. And when I saw him after BGT at um, it was like T4 on the beach, he like he knew me by name. He's like, oh hey Damien, how you doing? Like, and he was like just chatting away. And I said, we just became friends and like, you know. Then he asked me, he was like, hey, I'm getting married. Do you want to come? <laughs> I was like, I'd be honoured to. And uh, it's actually strange because it came off my Facebook memories the other day saying oh, um, about his wedding. So I remember saying, it's going to be a long time before I see anyone do a better first dance than that. Like, it was <laughs> nominal, phenomenal. Uh, um, yeah, he is um, super gracious. But again, the great thing with Ashley was he was honest as well. It's like, you know, the first bit I was like, you know, is it going to be all that? Like, I thought maybe it was this. You know, and then you just took it. So, you know, he was, you know, he, I felt like it was like, he was going to give me a fair shot. He wasn't going to be like, just sing my praises. If he thought it wasn't very good, I felt like he'd be very honest and go, it's not good. And, and all of the routines that you did through BGT were exceptional. I mean, really, really well done. The, the, the one that you did with, was it Amanda's phone at the end? I mean, I just, yeah, I just, I just, I, just, I, I, I remember watching that. I was like, what? That just makes no sense. Like, was it hard to, you know, you've done such a great, well-rounded routine in the in the auditions. Was it uh, mm. was some pressure on you to kill it again? Yeah, there, you know, in the, in the, there was there was always pressure. I mean, like the semi-final, the ultimate prediction box that came in the night before. We changed a 
part of the routine out the night before. We was like, oh crap. And uh, quickly was like rehearsing nonstop in the dressing room with it. And just went down well. And then with the last one, we was coming up with so many different ideas. We had this idea from very early, like I was chatting to Russ about, I was like, look, and I told Russ, when I want to take a phone and I want it to turn into a bunch of photos, like about a bunch of memories. I mean, I think this would be a really cool thing because we all keep our photos on our phones because we were talking about this idea of like, at the beginning of, um, you know, using uh, a photo in a phone and then like pulling it out. And I was like, let's do this. And then like, I mean, it'd be a really cool moment if we could do it. And it took a while for us to figure out how this routine was going to plan. But we came up with other routines before it and Beatrice was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not, like, we, we want something more. And um, I was adamant as well that I wanted to do a phone trick. I was like, I've done phone tricks for the last two. I need to do something with a phone. And so it just worked. And the, uh, yeah, like the whole thing with Amanda was like, we had so many different ideas of how we was going to make it vanish as well. And like, they was like literally bonkers. And I was just like, yeah, we're not doing that guys. Like we're not doing this. And like Mark Lavelle was really helping out loads of it. Uh, Mitch O'Brien, Bo Kramer, uh, Bob Pound. I had some really brilliant people like all involved with uh, these routines. And yeah, I've done it without any of them. And uh, yeah, it was such a fun one, that last one. And I got to admit that when her phone dropped on the floor, my heart sank a bit. I was like, please don't be broken. Please don't be broken. Please don't be broken. I tried to say really calm. Like, Just pick it up, man. I was like, inside, like, literally crying. <laughs> but you couldn't tell that you were phased by that at all. Like, oh, it, it's, if you know, I think if the camera panned down to my legs, I would have seen him shaking a little bit. <laughs> it, it would have been going. <laughs> it was definitely gone at that point. I was like, oh my God. Like, and I was like, we're near the home stretch. Just, you're nearly there. Like, but because we was originally, we kept saying, in the rehearsals, like, okay, put your hand over the glass. But what it was doing, it was blocking the overhead shot, which they didn't end up bloody using anyway in the end. And um, we could have done it. So if it came out, her hand would have grabbed the phone. But I think it kind of added to the routine anyway. Mm, yeah, it was definitely suspenseful. So, you know, we've, we've, co- we've talked about your whole career. There's a couple of things that I want to I wanna finish up on because you, you smashed BDC. A couple of questions I want to finish up on. Sure. Have you ever considered like releasing magic to the magic community? Because it's obvious when speaking to you, you're a creative guy, but you've channeled a lot of your creativity into yourself and developing stuff for your clients and your brand mm. that you work with. Would you ever consider like going down the route of, you know, like creating a project that you offer to magicians or is that something that's never... Um. I think I would. I mean, I've spoken to the Christopher so many times like, about tricks and stuff like that. And we've, we've come up with ideas and then sometimes they sort of fizzle out. I'm like, no, it just doesn't feel right. Um, you know, like uh, ages ago, I collaborated on an idea with a guy named Neon, which you know, it was a trick that came out of Alakazam. Um, but I feel like it's, it's got to be right. And it, it's really annoying. Like, it's like so many, like, you know, people when you, you release a trick, well, you think you've come up with this great idea, and they're like, I oh, know, but someone has done that ages ago. It's like, damn it, like, because <laughs> you've not heard of it. It's actually already out. It's like, what has been creative there? So, um, no, I think it would be something I would like to do. Um, anything that is actually helping, you know, someone out with their performances, if they can use it and it can benefit them, then 100%. Um, but again, it just has to feel like, has to feel right that I'm you know, not just putting it out for the sake of putting it out, that, that I would feel honestly proud this out. Because I've seen magicians rush a trick, they, they want it out just for the sake of saying, I've got a trick out. And then it, they're disappointed because it didn't do well. Yeah. And it's like, I think you've got to be believing your product if you're going to put it out. So I think that's probably why I've never put the ones out with D. It's like, D's always pushing at me. It's like, man, we need to come up with some stuff here on the 90 point. You know, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like he, he pushes me all the time to do it. Yeah, he's a, he's quite a, uh, he's a he's a guy that's very difficult to say no to. D. Um, he is. He is. He's an awesome guy. Okay, so let me ask you a question. What's next? And what I mean by that is you're you're still a very young guy. You've done so much in your career. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning, if you just took, if you just said to your average magician, well, you can have your own ensemble TV show. Yeah. 
If I can get to the final of BGT, yeah, you can go and pin and tell a fool us. Yeah, like all of this that you work with, work with all the stuff that you do on social media, you have had so many career defining high moments that, have, yeah. you know, I mean, so many, there's so many magicians and there's nothing wrong with this, but there's so many people who get into magic and they just gig and gig and gig and gig and gig and then retire. And that's fine. That's not a problem. Yeah. But I think anybody who's a performer dreams of doing something more and you've done yeah. so much. What, is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't achieved yet? It, what, what does the future hold for Damien O'Brien? Um, there is a few things I want to achieve still. I mean, like I'm always trying to set myself new goals. I think that's important. Um, like I would love to do um, like my own sort of series, like on say like a, a Netflix or Apple TV, something like that. I think that would be incredible you know like you know, a lot of people we would all love to do that so i'm always kind of trying to think of ways how would i if i was to do my own magic show what would it be different to make it to other people like would it stand out like that's got to be important as well not to just be like oh it's kind of like recycled materials another show it has to be something new and catchy where people are going to want to sit down and want to watch it each week if it's coming out each week um so yeah there's definitely i'd love to still do a tv show um maybe one day potentially do a tour i think that would be quite fun to do but again i i really really need to work on it because again I, i'm not a stage magician so uh, i'd say that all the time like i've got to figure out something that feels you know correct i mean look at david blaine look how long it took him to finally do something on stage because he's, he's a close-up magician and he pretty much done a lot of his uh, stunts and stuff like he's done over the years on stage which works um so I think it's just having, uh, you know, I, I, things happen for a reason. I always say that. And I believe sometimes opportunities just present itself when you're least expecting it. So for me, it's just like constantly just continue to work hard, um, constantly chase brands. I'm probably going to do some stuff with some other brands. I might, I'll be honest, I'm already talking to some other brands about some stuff which is going to come out soon. So uh, that is happening. Um, and we're excited about that. So that'll probably be out later this year, I reckon. Um, I'm just waiting for dates of filming but yeah there's always something and it's just um i think it's being consistent don't stop so you've just got to work 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 and i think yeah there'll be the next things for me just more branding work um hopefully maybe one day another tv show who knows so fantastic fantastic it has been an absolute pleasure and an honor having you on the channel. It really oh, has been my pleasure, man. Seriously, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. I'm a big fan. I really am. I followed your career <laughs> right from the very beginning. And you've always you. you've always delivered. You've always delivered. You. you know what? You know what? That that you are such an ambassador for magic. I bet you there's so many magicians out there, young magicians that are magicians today because they saw you, whether it be on Penn and Teller Foolers or it be on something else that they're in this game because they saw you do something on tv and thank you so much seriously thank you keep doing what no, you do thank you no i will i will i mean uh, i always say i'll be doing this until the day i no longer have nothing left to give and i still feel like i've got something left to give so i'm just going to keep having fun and i think that's an important point as long as you're having fun doing it keep doing it you know what what a great way to end an interview because that is absolutely true if you're not if you don't enjoy it why do it? You know, if you if you're gonna do something, yeah, you gotta enjoy it, right? Yeah, you have. Yeah, you have. I mean, it's the thing. There's so many people who are like, you know, they do these like they do magic, and uh, I've spoken to them before, and they're like they're not happy. With it. I'm like, then you're still young enough to go to do something else. Be passionate. I always say you've got to be passionate about it. Like, and you know, magic is we know it's a hard career to have as a full time job. It's a hard career, and I think you've really got to have drive and passion to want to succeed and I, I believe in that thing of law of attraction. If you really want it, it will happen. Like if you work your ass off for it, it will happen. Boom. Fantastic. Damon, thank you once again. Uh, I'm going to put your socials down below. Uh, people can contact cool. you. Uh, people can uh, sure. check you out on... Uh, follow, Instagram. follow, follow, follow. <laughs> yeah, all this stuff. Make sure you follow Damon on absolutely every channel he's on. And uh, and and leave a comment down below. I'm sure you can see them when when this goes live. Um, but uh, yeah, guys, make sure you subscribe to this channel as well as all of Damien's as well. And um, yeah, Damien, one more time. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, bro. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Guys, I'll see you tomorrow.